Hello and welcome to GMBN Tech. This is my shock explainer, so I'll be talking you through all the elements that make up our rear suspension units. First things first, how do we measure shocks? There are two main measurements, and they are eye to eye and stroke length. Let's start with eye to eye. Now, of course, mountain bikes being mountain bikes, there are standards to consider. There are two main bodies of sizing, imperial and metric. Metric is the more recent and not only simplifies our shock sizes, but also has more of an emphasis upon bushing overlap and stiffness. Now you have two ways to find your dimensions. You can either use a ruler measuring from the center of each eyelet and then the stroke. Another way though, is to look for anything on the shock itself that you can plumb into the manufacturer's website and that will often tell you everything you need to know, including things such as the compression tune, as well as the sizing. For the stroke length, it does get a little bit more complicated. You see, rock shocks have a patent for the markings upon the shaft, so theirs will handily often just say, but what if the shaft says 50 millimeters, but it measures 55 millimeters? That will be because there is a stroke limiting space installed. This whole topic is really important when measuring sag, and knowing the true length of your stroke is absolutely vital. To double check, let all the pressure out and bottom out the shock, and measure from the bottom and make a note. Now, spacers normally come in multiples of 2.5 millimeters, so it's relatively easy to work out. Now, the best way to measure sag is to measure between the inside edges of your seals, not the middle, or the end. This is because on a 50 mil stroke length, a two mil discrepancy is absolutely huge. That could be the difference between shock setup perfection and downright dissatisfaction. Mountain bike shocks are, more often than not, push shocks. That means you push the shock into the stroke to generate wheel travel. This is different from a pull shock, where the shock actually extends as opposed to compresses during wheel travel. Now, pull shocks have been experimented with, most notably by Cannondale and Scott on their mid-travel bikes during the early part of the last decade, but they were never really commonplace. If a coil spring had a rate of 500 pounds, it would require 500 pounds of force to compress one inch. This is very easy to imagine and is one reason why coil springs are very linear. The force required for the first inch and the last inch are roughly similar. Air springs have a spring rate too, but we often talk about them in terms of air pressure, well, because it's kind of easier. You see, the rate of an air spring will vary through the stroke due to a term we call progressivity. This means it requires different amounts of force to move the unit through the same amount of stroke depending on where it is in its travel. This means that some bikes are far more suited towards air and its inherent progressivity than the linear feel of coil. If you have a linkage that actuates far more leverage at the end of the stroke, you probably wouldn't want to run a coil shock, else you could find out that you have very little in the way of bottom out resistance. On the other hand, if you had a bike that had a reduced leverage ratio at the end of the stroke, the suspension would be a lot more progressive as it would ramp up towards the end. This would mean that a low volume, highly progressive air shock could just be too progressive. This can of course be adjusted by using volume spaces, less air volume then more ramp up, or by using a progressive spring. A progressive coil spring is essentially dual rate, whereas a single rate spring would be very linear. A dual rate spring has two different spring rates. That means the lower rate will compress first, whilst giving some ramp up in the latter stages from the higher rate. So that's our coil springs, and we've spoken a fair bit about air chambers. But what is a negative air chamber, and how does that work? Well, I want you to imagine you're on a playground seesaw without any weight on the opposite end. As you drive your weight upwards, you quickly go to full travel, so to speak. To counter this, you think, hmm, I might put a backpack on. Now that's gonna be a lot harder to reach the limit of the seesaw, but it's also harder to get the bloody thing moving. So what you do is you think, hmm, I'm gonna add a small amount of weight to the other end. Now this helps things to get 
things moving. It means your legs have to generate less force against the ground. And that's basically it. Negative air chambers are there to overcome large amounts of stiction that you can get in air shocks. It's also worth noting that when positive air chambers go through their stroke, their pressure increases. But when the negative air chamber is getting vastly bigger, so the pressure reduces. This means it doesn't really impact the end stroke all too significantly. Negative air chambers are something of a buzzword currently, but all they are to do is to overcome the high amounts of stiction you get in air shocks and enable you to get into the stroke a bit easier. Similarly, by reducing the amount of force your legs are having to overcome when pushing up on that seesaw. I hope that makes a degree of sense. Compression is what we refer to as the type of damping or resistance the unit undergoes as we push the wheel into its travel. It's largely separated into high and low speed compression. Now a note here, high and low speed refers to shaft speed and not how fast you're riding. Now that's all very well and good, but what does that mean and what does it relate to? Well, low speed compression damping is normally the response to rider input or changes in how the bike is weighted be it pedaling, braking, or loading the transition of a jump, the shaft speed is relatively slow. A high shaft speed comes from big drops and hard impacts. A lot of shocks don't have external high speed compression damping adjustments. High shaft speeds are often the results of things other than the human body's movement, i.e. gravity and obstacles. Now, if you don't have enough compression damping, it can be a real cause of instability. Conversely, too much and it can make the bike feel unresponsive and a bit wooden. Adjusting our compression damping can be done externally, either by diverting or restricting oil flow, or indeed by preloading shims, and needs to change depending on riding style and rider weight. It can massively affect fuel, and combined with spring rate, can really help you fine tune a bike for the rider. Are climb switches a compression adjustment? Well, absolutely, but there are a few different ways to realize this. Now, absolute lockouts for climb switches are becoming less common, and this is for a number of reasons. As much as anything, they often just pass the flex onto somewhere else, like your tires. But also because damping is your friend and not your foe. Even on something like this Super Deluxe, it's actually just diverting oil through a different path, but it's always going to go through that base valve. This means that you should have compression damping if you take an unexpected hit with that climb lever engaged. Rebound, like compression, also comes in high and low speed and is relative to spring rate and style. But what is high speed rebound? Surely the shock always wants to come back at the same speed. Well, it depends how much energy is stored in that spring and how the bike is weighted. A lot of shocks only have external adjustment for low speed rebound, and high speed rebound is often adjusted via the internal shims. Riders who ride hard and run a high spring rate whilst constantly going deep into their travel might find they need added high speed rebound adjustment to stop getting bucked after very large hits. For most of us though, the slow shaft speed adjustment and stock rebound tune is ample. The rebound circuit tends to have a far heavier damping tune compared to the compression circuit because of the vast amount of force that can be stored in our springs. Also, it's worth noting that a high amount of rebound can actually mimic compression as the bike gets bogged down in its stroke. Whichever adjustment you're making, just try and be methodical. And my best advice would be to set sag properly and then experiment. So that's rebound and compression. But how do the shocks actually control them? Well, a damper often consists of a piston, a column of oil and an expansion chamber. As the piston is being driven through the oil, it is of course trying to control the weight at which the oil throws through it. In the compression stroke, the piston is letting a controlled amount of oil through, but also pushing the oil away from it. 
therefore it needs somewhere to go. This expansion is either taken up in the form of an expanding bladder, like the ones typically found on our fork cartridges, a through shaft, which is a technology most notably employed by Trek, in which a shaft extends out of the body, or an internal floating piston, an IFP. An IFP can be pressurized via air, such as in a lot of shocks, or indeed via a coil, which is becoming increasingly common in forks. You may have also heard of the term called twin tube. Think of a twin tube damper, a bit like a ring road around a congested town. Because if you're trying to force all the traffic both ways down a single lane high street, it can easily become overwhelmed. A twin tube design often relies on very restricted oil flow through the main piston in everything but very high load. This moves the whole column of oil through the compression circuit before migrating back to the main body on the rebounding stroke. A system like that relies on something called a check valve. In a check valve, the oil can only flow one way. In one direction, it lifts a shim, almost like a trap door. But when it returns, the check valve then resets and blocks off the ports. Now, most suspension systems have relatively linear damping. That means that the progressivity is provided by the air spring and the damper just dictates at what rate you get there. But there are exceptions. For instance, the Italian brand EXT uses a hydraulic bottom out. Shims are essentially a leaf spring that bends and flexes. It does this as oil arrives through a port and forces the shim back. Now, when the oil pressure increases, so does the ease with which it bends the shim. To add more damping, you can, of course, use thicker shims, or you can use several thinner ones working in unison to provide some serious damping. Now, why would you want to use thinner shims, but more of them, rather than thicker ones? Well, think of it a bit like a telephone directory. Although the pages are very thin, they can resist load very effectively, but yet be more yielding than a solid block of the same size. Now, dampers can also resist the bike going through its travel by simply restricting oil flow. This might be due to an external needle shutting off a port, reducing its size, or indeed by diverting the oil altogether. Either way, it can be a very effective method. Often reshimming a shock is a timely and costly affair. So external adjustments such as these means base tunes can work better with more bikes and more riders. One of my favorite things about suspension is all these companies have so many different ways to get great results. For instance, Fox's variable valve control, VVC, manages to do something very interesting. Although it uses an external adjustment, it can affect the amount of preload on the shims. Now this is great because it means you can achieve something closer to a custom shimmed shock without any of the oil spills, swearing, or indeed cost of sending it away. Something that I personally feel is often overlooked in terms of shocks is, at least for me, stiffness. A stiffer shock will perform better, end of. We seem to be experimenting with that more and more in forks, and for good reason. But what about our frame suspension? Well, firstly, different designs will lend themselves to different issues. It's often the reason why a coil shock isn't a good idea. Not because of performance, but because the chassis simply isn't stiff enough. Similarly, it's why certain frames tend to work shock internals a lot harder than others. High amounts of flexing can lead to internal burps, scrapes, scratches, and in extreme cases, I've even seen shock shafts snap. Another element to this is trunnion. Trunnion is fantastic because it gives suspension designers essentially more real estate to fit everything in, and it works so well to achieve high levels of performance for some systems because it can just be oh so stiff. But if the frame stiffness isn't there, it can actually give a hard time for large diameter air shocks, let alone coil shocks. I guess the application, like always, is very, very important. 
Some companies are even experimenting with spherical bearing systems, which allow a degree of float. Now I think this is very exciting, although sadly it's something I've never tried for myself. That leads me nicely onto my next point, hardware and bushes. Most bushes are now 12.7 millimeters in diameter to fit into the shock, but it is always worth measuring. Once you fit the bush, then you have the hardware. The bush is often generic from the manufacturer, but it's the hardware you need to measure to fit your frame. You would need to know the total length as well as the internal and external diameters to be sure you're ordering the correct size. One end of the stroke often sees more wear than the other, and it's one of the reasons for bearing systems like this shock, which is actually off my nuke proof. It not only lasts a little longer, but it lets the shock work a little bit more freely, which is a good thing for small bump compliance. Now, I could of course talk about shocks for hours and hours. I just don't know if anybody would watch it. So that's it from me in my shock explainer. I hopefully covered most of the bases. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe as it really helps support the channel. And we'll see you next time.